We have a very special guest with us tonight on Facebook Live. As promised, we are joined by CEO of Rancho Obi-Wan, Steve Sansweet. Steve, welcome to Facebook Live on Coffee with Kenobi. Thank you very much, Dan. Where's the coffee? I asked you that the very first time, and you sent me a Starbucks gift card. That's so right. I can't ask you that again. I'm all serious. <laughs> That was good. That was that was really really fun. You were our first guest on our one year anniversary show, and and I tell you what, but we thought we won the lottery, and you were of course charming and wonderful. And it's always great to chat with you. Of course, you were on Coffee with Kenobi this week, and we're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about the Rancho Obi Wan Virtual Gala, which is coming up very very soon, and then we're also going. I have some questions that a lot of our loyal Coffee with Kenobi family members have submitted for you as well, but. Please, most importantly, talk to us about the, the virtual gala that Rancho Obi-Wan has cooking for us. Well, because we couldn't have our actual gala, obviously, because of the pandemic, we decided to have a virtual gala on November 21st. You can go to RanchoObiWan.org, get all of the details there. The tickets are 30 bucks, and we're going to have up to nine hours of Star Wars goodness entertainment streaming for you that day with a preview on November 20th. Um, we have uh, conversations that I'm going to be doing with Star Wars celebrities like Dave Filoni, Ashley Eckstein, James Arnold Taylor, uh, Sam Witwer, Ben Burt, four-time Oscar-winning sound designer, and lots of artists and Star Wars fellow fans, writers, uh, people who have worked in the fan communities to set up the 501st Legion, the Mando Mercs. Um, just uh, all kinds of uh, all kinds of great people, um, R2 builders, uh, people who have worked at Lucasfilm, uh, people who uh, love Star Wars and share their passion with us. It's wonderful, and you've got you've also got a lot of activity. So this is not a passive entertainment experience. This is something that very people get to be a part of the action. We have a lot of interactive things coming up. Uh, we have a costume contest. We have a scavenger hunt, which I, I love a scavenger hunt. Our uh, board of directors member, Duncan Jenkins, who's a fellow collector in the Kansas City area, uh, has come up with a great way to, uh, so regardless of what you have or may not have in your around you, you've got an hour from when you download the sheet of 10 items for the scavenger hunt, and there are three levels for each item. Nailed it. Well, pretty close, but I'm a Star Wars fan. Well, not so close, but we love you anyway. <laughs> so you can get three, two, one points for each of the ten items. We've got a, a prize wheel that Ann Newman, um, uh, the curator of Ranch Obi Wan, will be spinning. You'll be able to win all kinds of prizes and booby prizes too, like DC action figures. <laughs> um, We'll have a live auction, which is always one of the highlights of uh, of the Rancho Obi Wan Gala. Where we only we're really limited to about 125 to 150 people at the uh, live gala. So this is a way that we can open it up, and people who couldn't fly in, or we've had people from all over the world come to the gala. Uh, a lot of people just couldn't make it, couldn't afford it. This is a, this is a real great way to uh, join us for the gala for uh, our virtual gala. We've got uh, Spencer Brinkerhoff doing a um, how to draw a Star Wars character. Uh, you can do this at home with your kids. We have a trivia contest um, that will take place uh, separately from um, the, uh, the bulk of the programming. We have a uh, wine tasting, which has is, which is closed the final sale of the tickets. We did really well on that. And people will be getting Skywalker Ranch wine. And then after they're nicely mellow on the Skywalker Ranch wine, then the trivia contest takes place. <laughs> and we'll have a live Q&A with me. And we'll have some exclusive gala merchandise in the Rancho store. So all of that can be done by going to RanchoObiWan.org. You can look at everything. And then you can purchase a ticket for $30. It's wonderful. And that all goes to, all goes to support uh, uh, the serious business of Rancho Obi-Wan, such as uh, maintenance and security and insurance and things of that nature. That's right. And and all of the money that is raised for Rancho Obi-Wan year-round, gala or not, none of it goes to purchase collectibles. It's all done to take care of this wonderful museum. I've had the good fortune of being there three separate occasions. And I can promise you, everybody watching tonight, 
it's absolutely one of the finest ways to celebrate your love of Star Wars with this wonderful community that we have. It's going to be exciting. We're looking forward to it. We're looking forward to a lot of fans joining, and we've already sold a bunch of tickets, and we're looking forward to selling some more. I love it. Looking at you, Coffee with Kenobi community, be sure to sign up at the Rancho for the Rancho Obi-Wan Virtual Gala. It's going to be amazing. Speaking of amazing, Steve, uh, I put the call out and said I was going to speak with you, and we got a lot of wonderful questions people want to ask you. Uh, I did say, I think you'll appreciate this, I did say, look, Steve has answered a lot of questions over the years. Let's try to come up with some things he's never heard before. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. I deserve the right to say, uh, I'm not <laughs> sure about that. <laughs> so Andrew Harrison says, what application or method do they use to catalog the collection? I've been looking for the perfect solution for my own collection for a long time. I would love to know how the curator of the largest collection in the world keeps track of what they have and where everything is located. Well, Anne has developed a FileMaker database that we use. And the good news about this is our longer term plans for the virtual museum is to make this virtual data, this database available online. Wow. So we'll have the Rancho Obi-Wan collection, but you'll also be able to use that to tick off what you have in your own collection. So we're starting in various areas, and then uh, we're going to expand it to uh, all of the categories that you can imagine. But it's a FileMaker database, so it's the item. It's all kinds of information about the item. If it, Every item has a unique number because sometimes we have two or three of the same thing, but each one of those will get a unique number, and we'll know one of them may be on the museum shelves, uh, the other two may be in the warehouse, and we'll know where those are. But it's all through this unique uh, FileMaker database. We found FileMaker to be a very adaptable program to be able to add all kinds of functions to it and sort it in all kinds of ways. So we're very happy with that. Um, clearly, this year has uh, delayed us somewhat in uh, in getting this online, but we're we're working on the uh, other parts of the virtual museum. But eventually, this will be part of that. But we highly recommend the FileMaker as a as a good way to start. That's great. Well, he's a he's a huge collector, so that's definitely going to be beneficial. I've I've always wondered that myself. Ian Thompson wants to know which item in the vast Rancho Obi-Wan collection is most personally meaningful to you. Hmm. It might depend on the day, too, really. <laughs> <laughs> it might depend on that day's mail. <laughs> but there is there is one thing which is also the my favorite item in the museum that is personally meaningful to me, and that is the large canvas banner with the Star Wars logo and the Ralph McQuarrie art of the Star Killer taken from a cast and crew shirt and and glued onto the banner the banner the logo an early star wars logo hand painted by joe johnston who was at that point the art director of industrial light and magic and of course has gone on to become a movie director and this was used charlie lippincott who was the head of marketing and merchandising and licensing and so much more at the, in the early days of lucasfilm uh, was used to go to fan conventions because Charlie was a geek himself, a comic geek, and uh, knew about fans and how they related to things and wanted to go out and tell fans about Star Wars. So in 1976, he did about four or five conventions, in, mostly in Southern California, but also Worldcon in Kansas City that year. And this banner accompanied him to San Diego Comic-Con and Worldcon. We have photos of both of those places, so we know for sure they were at both of those places. So this was the beginning of fan relations for Lucasfilm. And many years later, when I started at Lucasfilm in 1996, wow, um, I followed in Charlie Lippincott's footsteps and Craig Miller's footsteps and... Uh, uh, this was this was really the beginning of fan relations as it exists today. That's great. What a great answer, too. Oh, man. You know, I, I had seen that. I didn't realize the, the, the steep history of that. Here, here's an interesting one, speaking of history. Mark Kleinheinz wants to know, what decade, in your opinion, produced the most emotionally evocative collectibles slash merchandising tie-ins? I mean, my hmm. initial thought would be the, the 70s, but that's probably too easy. 
That's a really that's hard one. A, that's a very that's a very tough question, and yeah. that's one of those questions like, ask me again next week, and it may be different. Uh-huh. Uh huh. But I think the seventies would be that because the seventies merchandise, the licensing of movies was not a thing until Star Wars came along. They had tried with a movie called Doctor, the first Doctor Do Little movie, and it was a huge failure. They were people were more successful licensing television shows because it was on every week. But the thought was, well, we can't license movies because by the time we find out whether it's going to be a success or not, it will take us too long to make the merchandise, and therefore, you know, people won't remember the movie by the time the merchandise came out. Not the mindset, oh, we'll make the merchandise in advance of the movie and have it ready on the shelves four weeks before the movie premieres. <laughs> That's a whole nother thing. Yes. Uh, so the uh, merchandise really had to catch up with the demand. And that's why I think Star Wars merchandise was so successful in the early days. I mean, at first we saw the T-shirt transfers, and you had to go to the T-shirt shops. They didn't even sell uh, initially in retail T-shirts with Star Wars uh, art on it. You had to go to the T-shirt shops, and there would be uh, you know 30 different decals that you could get pressed onto mm. the shirts. And uh, you would see in the early films when the the, the commercials the be doing disco moves and people <laughs> would be just jumping up and down with their Star Wars t-shirts on and the posters and then the first action figures in early 1978, um, uh, the puzzles. I mean, all that stuff is very evocative and it brings you back to that time when things were a lot simpler and you were getting your first kick off of the original Star Wars and then Empire Strikes Back, the Empire Strikes Back after that. And um, this was the early days of Star Wars fandom. And people were making their own costumes until Ben Cooper came out with costumes and Don Post Jr. came out with uh, the Star Wars masks. Um, that was a, a simpler and maybe a, a, a more, a better time, right. perhaps. Then a lot of those things you're mentioning are some of my favorite things to see at the museum because they do bring back those. I remember visibly after I was ice skating, going into a t-shirt shop, there was all like the iron-ons and then we had the Vader that later ended up became the logo on the Darth Vader underoos t-shirt. Right. Yeah. Right. Indeed. The underoos. How can I forget the yeah. underoos? <laughs> those are great. <laughs> uh, Greg McLaughlin, he runs the, the Rebel Base par Card podcast and he wants to know if you add to the Topps Cards collection annually. Well, I was buying every series of Topps card, Star Wars Topps card that there was until Topps started making 10 series a year. And some of the series cost $100 a box for eight cards. Yeah. And um, I must say Topps sort of lost me. Mm -hmm. And so I still buy uh, a shelf box of the cards, but... Um, I'm, I used to collect everything and so, some of the, uh, some of the card series from not that long ago, uh, I tried to get like every artist, uh, who, uh, who was doing art for the Topps cards. And I, I mean, there's one series that I spent, um, four figures on, um, to try to collect all, maybe almost five figures on. And then I realized, this is insane. <laughs> Pieces of cardboard, which I have to take the binder off the shelf and look at. I mean, they still do a great job, but um, I can't buy everything these days. I'm, I'm not a wealthy... People think I'm a millionaire. I'm not a wealthy man. I've just spent all my money buying things new mm -hmm. and... Um, have been lucky to find some things in the early days when very few other people were buying Star Wars. Uh, and that's why I wrote my first book from Star Wars from concept to screen to collectible and had so much in there about the prototyping of toys and the early versions of things. And that book, a lot of people thanked me or cursed me for turning them into collectors as a result of that book, which came out in 1992. Yes. And I have mine. I have my copy. I love that book. Uh, here's an excellent one from Blake Weaver. He says, for most collectors, the main way we shop is online due to convenience and a lack of supply in physical stores. 
Does Steve feel there's a magic in hunting for merchandise that's been lost with almost all shopping being done online as opposed to hunting for Star Wars merchandise in a physical store? I think some of the magic has been lost, but some of the magic was also some of the agony. I can remember going to uh, Toys R Us, you know, like every, you know, early uh, once a week when on a Tuesday or when I forget what day it was when the new action figures would come out and uh, the Micro Machines collectors would be there. And, uh, you know, a lot of people were buying things to just to sell on eBay. And that was a bit distressing. And um, but but I would go into in the early days, I would go into lots of toy stores. There were more independent toy stores. There were Toys R Us on the West Coast, Kitty City uh, on the East Coast. Um, so wherever I was, whenever I would travel for the Wall Street Journal, I would try to find some extra hours to go and find toy shops, local toy shops. Um, and you just don't find many independent toy stores these days. And of course, Toys R Us is no more. And so it's now Target. And, uh, and, and where I live, uh, it's a lower level of uh, Walmart and Target. And so a lot of the merchandise is not in these stores. Um, you have to travel. And so it's easier and not as much fun to find stuff online. But things sell out like that yeah. when you know that a Lego special is coming out or something is coming out on the Target site. It just seems to disappear in two minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, I think uh, I think it's... Um, the same degree of difficulty. I agree. Yeah, there, there's nothing like that thrill of the hunt, but then by the time you get to the aisle and you go through all the baby clothes and all the other stuff through Walmart to get to where you want to go, sometimes it's it's not there, and that can be frustrating. So it is it is definitely a mixed blessing. I really like how you explain that. Colby Mead wants to know, is there a specific... I'm, I don't think there's going to be an answer for this. Uh, is there a specific collectible that you haven't been able to get? In other words, is there a one that got away? <laughs> I never thought about that. That's great, Colby. I'll tell you one that got away. Yeah. And I'm I don't know whether I'm happy that it got away or I'm sad that it got away. But many years ago, and this probably goes back to the eighties, um, and maybe fairly early in the eighties, I was at a show and walking through the aisles and from the side side vision I saw what looked like um, a portrait of Chewbacca, but sort of a three-dimensional portrait of Chewbacca. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I think I'll go over there and take a look at it. And then I saw there was an E.T. portrait. So E.T. So I think E.T. had just sort of come out, or so it was 82, 83. And um, so I, I looked at it, and it looked the Chewbacca portrait looked sort of furry. And I said to the uh, owner of the, of the booth, so tell me, what, what is this about? And he said, oh, well, we sweep up a barbershop floor, we clean up the hair, and then we paste it down to make these portraits of these <laughs> characters. <laughs> and my stomach did a flip. <laughs> and I said, oh, thank you, and walked away. And, and I think I regret it. Because clearly when somebody asked me what the tackiest item in the museum is, I could point to this Chewbacca hair portrait and say, this is it. But it got away. Oh, I'd say that's a blessing in disguise. <laughs> that story is invaluable. I love that. <laughs> uh, so, so Minta Putva, and Minta, I don't know if I've ever pronounced your last name before. I apologize if I said it incorrectly. She wanted to know if, now she knows this is a hard question to answer, and, and probably one you've heard a lot, but... While you obviously love what you have, are there certain favorites that just kind of speak to you for whatever reason? Maybe the memory of them or just just the novelty of what they are that doesn't involve body hair? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, some of some of my vintage pieces, um, I have the original Obi-Wan Kenobi figure that I opened carefully opened hmm. but i still have the package that i opened and tried to sort of tape back but because i put all 12 action figures on my shelf 
And so, uh, but I have got my original Obi-Wan Kenobi figure and Obi-Wan meant so much to me in the movies um, that my original Obi-Wan action figure speaks to me and it is really a favorite of mine. And it's the original, the first one I bought, one of the first things I bought in the, in the stores, probably my first action figure. That's beautiful. That's, that's beautiful. Uh, Tyler wants to know, is there any dream collectibles uh, that you want that no one has ever made? In other words, you talked to Hasbro or Sideshow. Hey, can you make this? What was the second word? Any what kind of collectible? Uh, like a dream, like a dream collectible oh, that has okay. not been made yet. Um, I've been asked this by uh, by Hasbro. <laughs> oh, cool. Uh, and the, they haven't made it. I mean, I... And I've managed to source one for myself by having fan-made things. The, the holographic, the Jarek table, the holographic oh. chess table, and the creatures, the hologram, the uh, the um, um, hologram creatures that were in Star Wars. It always seemed to me to be a great idea. And my friend Philip Wise in Texas made uh, several of the chess tables. And they're electronic. The keys light up. They're beautiful. We have it at Rancho Obi Wan. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a guy in the Midwest sculpted the hollow creatures, and um, uh, he did a, a remarkable job. Then there was a company in Japan a couple of years ago that made two of the creatures at a pretty good size, not the miniature ones like you. You know, the sideshow has done miniature versions of them. Um, and I thought, oh, well, they're going to put out the whole line. They stopped at those two. Apparently, my dream project was not anybody else's dream project. <laughs> Nobody bought them because they didn't make any more than the first two. Oh, wow. Well, those, those ones at Galaxy's Edge are, are quite nice. Yeah, those are. They finally, you know, somebody was listening to me. I forgot about that. <laughs> I haven't bought that yet. I've been to Galaxy's Edge once um, the, prior to uh, the opening day. And I thought I would just buy out the park and just, just, but I flew in that morning and was flying out that evening and they weren't set up to mm -hmm. send merchandise home. Uh -huh. And so I ended up being very disappointed and saying, well, I'll come back. And I've never made it back while they were open. Right. You know, I, I was there then too. I'm, it's unfortunate I didn't get to run into you, but they, I remember thinking, what? Come on, you got some of the biggest Star Wars fans on the planet here. Let's go. But it'll all work out. Eventually we'll get there. Maybe it was a blessing in disguise at the time. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. I uh, just got just got it. Two more. Uh, Darren Wilson says, has there been any thought of moving any part of the collection to a traditional museum? For example, the museum that George Lucas is working on building. Well, George's museum in Southern California in Los Angeles is a billion dollar project where he's going to have, I mean, it's an art museum yeah. and a fine art museum and a museum of uh, storytelling art and uh, great pieces. He's also going to have stuff from Star Wars. He's going to have uh, costumes and um, some of the ships and some of the map paintings and things of that nature. There's really no room for merchandise on display in, in a place like that. So we have had some of the products on display when we do our booths at Star Wars Celebration. That's what the Rancho Obi-Wan booth uh, consists of. For Celebration Chicago, we had about 50 uh, Star Wars helmets. We had uh, a Star Wars uh, female outlook. We changed, uh, we redressed a mannequin every day of the celebration in Star Wars uh, wonderment. wonderment. Uh, we had... Uh, uh, 20 years of Star Wars Celebration merchandise and and art. Um, it was the anniversary, and um, and one other aspect which I'm forgetting right now. But so that that's what we've done on a temporary kind of basis. That's great. That's great. Uh, Mary Purdue, last one says, uh, "What are your plans for collecting over the next 30 to 40 years?" <laughs> The next 30 to 40 years, well, as I'm going down the aisle on my walker, <laughs> um, 
I think Star Wars is certainly going to be with us for the next 30 to 40 years for the foreseeable future. Um, uh, you know, regardless of whether it's uh, television, uh, animation, uh, movies, um, uh, books, comics, merchandise, a combination of all of the above probably, uh, and, and things yet to come such as virtual reality. We're certainly into virtual reality in Star Wars now. Um, so uh, I plan to keep collecting, although on a more modest basis, because I simply can't afford the, the way I was spending in the past. Um, but we do get lots of contributions in kind to Rancho Obi-Wan. And so there are things that I have not purchased that sort of end up here. And Anne says, at some point, everything is going to end up at Rancho Obi-Wan. We plan for Rancho Obi-Wan to continue into the far distant future. Amen to that. Well, it, it's it's a wonderful, wonderful place. It, when Once everything opens up, you simply must go and tour. But in the meantime, the Rancho Obi-Wan Virtual Gala is absolutely the place to be. I will be there, absolutely. It'll be the best $30 that you spend, and people can go to RanchoObiWan.org, and it's on November 24th, correct? 21st. 21st. I'm an English teacher, not a math teacher. Saturday the twenty first. <laughs> Saturday the twenty first. It's it's the is this the Saturday before Thanksgiving? Yes. Yeah. Well, hey, that's great. That that's a great way to start an an incredibly important week for family. And Star Wars is all about family, and nobody does it better than you, Steve. Thank you so much for being a guest on CWK Facebook Live tonight. Thanks, Dan. My pleasure, always. 